just making sure he's no longer mute. He can come up here and you'll, you'll hear him preach. It's good to have these brethren with us, as I said this morning. Uh, some of you may not be aware as to the reason why these brethren come over, and I thought it might be good just to give you an insight into why these men uh, are here for our week of prayer in North America. For those of you who don't know our denomination here, uh, the mother denomination is in Northern Ireland. And whenever we became our own denomination in 2005, there was a desire to maintain the ties between the brethren in the UK and the brethren over here. And so part of that to help maintain those ties is that uh, once a year we send two men from our presbytery as delegates over there, and then once a year they send two over to us as well. It just maintains that friendship, that fellowship, that support that continues to this day, uh, even standing with each other in various aspects of missionary endeavor and beyond, and even sometimes sending preachers from there over here, and on occasion even from here over there as well. We're very glad to have the Reverend Raymond Robinson with us. He pastors a church in Kesh, Free Presbyterian Church. And again, that's not a place you're likely to know where it is, but it's in Northern Ireland, and he's been there for many years, laboring and ministering to the flock there. But we trust that he'll know the warmth of the Lord's people when he finishes. Uh, I'll just encourage him to go to the door, make sure everyone here, as you pass by, show your appreciation and welcome to this brother as well as the Reverend Murray also. So, God bless you, brother. Come and bring us the word. I would like to thank our brother Tomasian for the kind words of welcome and for the opportunity to come and to minister amongst you today. And it is a privilege to be here and to labor in the Lord and to fellowship with those in this part of the world. Uh, it's new to me, but over in Greenville, I've looked in perhaps the odd time on Sermon Audio, but it's good to be here and to fellowship with you in the Lord's name. And we trust that we know the Lord's blessing this evening. And we would like to thank our brother Tomasian and his family for their hospitality and their fellowship today. He was speaking about hospitality a moment ago, and he has led a by practice, and we've experienced that even this afternoon. And I have a wee problem with this jacket. It doesn't close that well. Uh, meeting with him, that didn't help. But we are delighted to be here and to fellowship with you in the things of God. We want, first of all, to turn to the Scriptures. We're turning this evening uh, to Luke's Gospel, the chapter 13. Gospel of Luke, the chapter 13. And we want just to break into the chapter. We're breaking in at the verse 18 of the passage. Luke chapter 13, the verse 8. We read, Then said he, Unto what is the kingdom of God like? Whereunto shall I resemble it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and cast into his garden, and it grew and waxed a great tree. The fowls of the air lodged in the branches of it. And again he said, Whereunto shall I liken the kingdom of God? It is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. He went through the cities and villages teaching, and journeying toward Jerusalem. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate, for many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up, it hath shut to the door, and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. Then he shall answer and say unto you, I know not whence ye are. Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence. Thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, when you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. They shall come from the east and from the west, and from the north and from the south, and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. And behold, there are last which shall be first, and there are first which shall be last. 
The same day there came certain of the Pharisees, saying unto him, Get thee out and depart thence, for Herod will kill thee. And he said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow, and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, and verily I say unto you, ye shall not see me, until the time come when ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And we end our reading at the close of the chapter, and we know that God will bless his word to each of our hearts this evening. I want tonight to focus your attention there in the words that are found in verse 34. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets, and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. And with that little text of Scripture in our hearts and minds, let's just still our hearts, and let's bow and ask for God's help as we come to his word this evening. Our loving God and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for thy precious word. We thank you, Lord, for this canon of Scripture. We thank you, Lord, for these words that we've read together that speak of the earthly ministry of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Dear Father God, this evening as we come to look at this text of Scripture, I ask and pray that thou would grant us that help from on high. Our Father God, we come to thee, desiring, Lord, that you would take these old lips of clay, touch them, Lord, with that life called from off the altar, that we might be enabled to speak of thee and to uplift our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, come and meet with us here. Lord, still every heart. Close out every distracting thought, we do pray. And Lord, for these moments, keep us alone with thee and speak and challenge our hearts afresh, we pray. Lord, tarry with us and bless. For it's in Jesus' precious name we ask all of these things. Amen. As you and I read through the Bible, we find time and time again, that the various writers, the Old Testament writers, they use pictures that are drawn from an agricultural background. I myself grew up on a farm, and as you read through the Scriptures, you notice these little references. We think of the prophet Isaiah. And there in that well-known chapter in Isaiah 53, he draws our attention to the sheep and how that you and I as individuals and sinners in this world are likened unto the sheep. He says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. We think of the prophet Hosea, and there as he brings the printed page to our attention, he speaks of the nation of Israel, and there he describes them as that backsliding heifer, as a people who would not listen to God. They rebelled against him and twisted and turned as it were in every manner, rather than obey the God of heaven. And it is no surprise as we come and we see the greatest teacher of all, the Lord Jesus Christ. And here in this passage and here in this little text that we've mentioned this evening, we see here that the Lord Jesus Christ, he draws our attention again to that farming picture. He draws before us the hen and speaks there in the latter parts of this verse of the hen gathering her brood under her wings, and ye would not. Personally, I can look back to a time when, as a young boy or a youngster, if you're familiar with that term, we used to visit my grandmother's. And her farm differed a little from ours in that she kept hens. And sometimes there were boxes out for the hens to lay in. Sometimes they didn't lay where they ought to be. And she would send us out, we boys, send us to look in different places. She would say, I saw hens over there. Go you and have a look and see are there any eggs. And at times we would come upon a hen and she was clocking. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that term. She was incubating the, the eggs, or maybe six eggs under that hen, and she was sitting on them. And maybe in a few weeks' time, you would see that hen again. And this time, there would be a group of little yellow chicks running after her around her feet. And many a time, you would have watched, and you saw the hen walking up the yard, and the chicks in behind. And then you would hear a vehicle approach, and you would see the feet of that hen speed up, and the wings go out, and she would gather in the little chicks and get them safely into a corner. 
And that's the picture that the Lord Jesus Christ is presenting here before us in this text of Scripture. We look at the natural realm and we see the care that is there within the animal kingdom. And here the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, takes this picture and he brings us before us in this passage of God's Word. And for a few moments this evening, I want to draw your attention to this text and I want you to look with me at the tender care that we see in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we look at this little text, you'll notice how it begins. It begins with those words, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And as we think of that name, Jerusalem, we're mindful that it is the capital city of Israel. We find it first reference in that terminology back in the book of Joshua, there in the chapter 10 and the verse 1. And it speaks about Adonizak, and it describes him as the king of Jerusalem. It is a name that means city of peace. As you think of the latter part of the name, Salem, it brings your attention there to Genesis. And there we read of Melchizedek. And he is described as the king of peace. And we see that link within the name. But the Lord Jesus Christ here in this text, while he uses these words, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he's not merely just referring to the city. I believe here the Lord Jesus Christ is bringing in every individual inhabitant of the place, but even wider than that, he's bringing in the nation of Israel. As we think of this city of Jerusalem, it was her capital. It was representative of the people there. And there the Lord Jesus Christ, and using this name, he's indicating that great affection that he had for the historical city, but wider still for the nation of Israel. They, this city was representative of that nation. We think of that picture of representation, and we are reminded of Adam. And how as we look at him in Scripture, and his name is used, he is that representation of the human race. It ties into the words of the Apostle Paul there in 1 Corinthians 15 and 22, when he says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ as shall all be made alive. Paul is indicating there that when Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, as her father, he is our federal head, and therefore we all sinned and fell in him in a first transgression. But to come back to this chapter here, as we think of this title, this name of Jerusalem here, it was also spoken of in regard to the worship of the nation of Israel. How many times we read of the Jews heading to Jerusalem, we think of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, and there with Mary and Joseph, he is taken up to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. We have in the Acts of the Apostles that account of the Ethiopian eunuch. And again, he's traveling to Jerusalem. He's going to that place of worship. So here is the Lord Jesus Christ uses this name. He uses this title. He's identifying this city with the Jews. He's identifying it with the residents of the land of Israel and with that place of worship. We also find that indicated in other portions of the Scripture. Over in 1 Kings, in the chapter 21, we find there that Samaria is linked with Ahab. He is described as Ahab, king of Samaria. Whenever that time when Israel was divided after Solomon, there was a northern kingdom, there was a southern kingdom, and that northern region was sometimes called Samaria. So there you have that, that same thought. Samaria is used to, to represent that northern region. Isaiah the prophet, in the chapter 29, in the opening verses, he speaks of Ariel. He says, Woe to Ariel, to Ariel, the city where David dwelt. And again, there is that reference to the city of Jerusalem. That's what he's speaking of there. And that particular word it is speaking of judgment upon the nation of Israel. So as we look at this verse and we read these words of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, we see there are words that encompass the Jewish people. Here Christ is speaking of all that he has done for the nation of Israel, and he's drawing this to attention here in this particular verse. We also notice the repetition of the name here. And it indicates that while the Lord has a love and desire upon the nation of Israel, it indicates the extent of that love. He repeats the name. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And you can hear in his voice, as it were, that, that, that love, that affection for this people. We see the same expression as he speaks of the home of Lazarus. There we read in Luke 10 in the verse 41 of Jesus speaking to Martha, and he goes, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. There was a, a tenderness there, a compassion there. We think of 
the disciple Peter, that one who denied the Lord. And there we find that the Savior speaks to him there in Luke 21. And he said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you. There is that compassion. He gets the attention and he seeks to impress upon the mind of Simon Peter that there is one who is after him. And here in this verse 34, Christ is speaking of the city of Jerusalem. And he's indicating the love and the tenderness he has toward these people. Brings your attention to the words that are found there in chapter 19. In the verse 41, and there again we read of Christ. It says, and when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. The Lord Jesus Christ, as he enters this place, and we've read in this chapter here how he was coming toward Jerusalem. If you look at verse 22, he's heading in that direction. And as he goes in that way, his, his mind is focused on them. And his heart is heavy. He thinks of the many times that he has intervened in the affairs of the nation of Israel. And he comes with his great love and tenderness and says, How often would I have gathered thy children together? He uses that word often. We use it in conversation today and we just skip over as it were, but here he says how often. He's indicating time. He's bringing the attention of the reader here, not merely to Jerusalem, the city, but he's bringing that concept of time, that, that concept of repetition. He's saying time and again, I have gathered your children together. We can look at the scriptures and we look back to the time of Joseph. There God sent Joseph down into the land of Egypt and he suffered greatly at that time, going down as a, a young boy that became a slave. But God was purposing to preserve the nation of Israel or the family of Jacob when the famine came. You can move a little bit forward in time and you think of their captivity in Babylon. There again we find that God had established a king, a king by the name of Cyrus who he described as a shepherd. He was there to release the people and to let them go back to their homeland of Israel. There are many other accounts that we could use in Scripture that indicate the often times, the many times that God dealt graciously with His people, that God preserved them on the battlefield, that, that God liberated and miraculously provided for them. It's an insight into the patience and the long-suffering of the God in which we trust. We think of Moses on his time on the mount, and how he desired to get a little glimpse of God. And it's interesting the words he heard at that time. Exodus 34, the verse 6, it says, The Lord passed by before them and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and in truth. And as we think of the God of heaven, as we think of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, just in these words we see that tender compassion that God extends to a fallen world. We see that fulfilled in the atoning death that he wrought there on the cross of Calvary that sinners might be saved. God had warned them. Oftentimes, mention is made in this text here of the prophets. You and I can go through the scriptures. We can look at the words of Elijah. We can think of Elisha. We can think of Samuel. We can think of Ezekiel, Jeremiah, these prophets that ministered and warned the nation of Israel time and again to repent and turn from their sin. And yet they rebelled against God. Is it any wonder that he uses that language there at the start of the verse? Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee. They were a people and God had privileged them. God had blessed them. God had intervened in their affairs for his honor and for his glory and still they rebelled against him. You know, as we think upon that, dear friend, we, we ask the question tonight, is, has God ever intervened in your life? Has there been that time when you were traveling down the road and it is only by the grace and mercy of God that you arrived at your destination safely? Maybe an accident in the workplace. Maybe an incident that took place within the confines of your home. And all of these things were, were God speaking to you and God has preserved your life. He's been patient and long-suffering to you, desiring that you might be saved. Vindicates His grace and His mercy. 
grace upon grace when you consider all that he has done for his people. Brings to mind the warning. As we think of the word often as it's used here, it reminds us that God takes note. God took account of the times he'd intervened in the nation of Israel. God took note of the times that he sought to direct the Jews to the things of God and, and pleaded for them. And does it not remind us again, dear friend, this evening that God is an account of every time he speaks to you? Every time you've sat in a gospel meeting and you've heard the scriptures opened, you've heard your need of salvation, and, and God has noted that. Time and time and time again, and the reminder is there will come that time when that voice will be silent. We often quote those words found in Genesis where God says, My spirit shall not always strive with man. Dear friend, maybe God has been speaking to your heart, and you've known that sound. You've heard it challenging, convicting, and speaking to you, and yet you are not right with God. It may come that time when that tender voice will be silent. We look at Scripture and we think of that first king of Israel, Saul. A man who rebelled against God, and there came that point in his life where God no longer communed with him because of his sin and waywardness. We think of David, the psalmist. David sinned against God. And when you read those wonderful words in, in Psalm 51, where he comes with that repentant heart, he says, Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. There's an indication there that there was that silence for a time because of sin. As we look in these words here, we see Christ's interest in the nation of Israel. We see the tenderness. We see the love that is indicated here, that foresight that speaks of that atoning work on the cross of Calvary, where he would bleed and die for his people. As he speaks of Jerusalem here, he's speaking of a people whom he walked amongst, people whom he performed miracles for, miracles of healing, miracles of provision. And yet in a few days' time, he would there go to the cross of Calvary and show that love in a greater fashion, and that he would die that sinners might be saved. I want you to notice not only the compassion that is here, but I want you to consider the comparison that he uses. The Lord Jesus Christ uses that picture. He says there, as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wing, as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. This parable here, it, it compares the, the compassion and care, as we've mentioned already, of that mother hen. It, it compares that with the Lord Jesus Christ with his compassion, his tenderness towards sinful man. And we see that picture of the wings and the compassion of Christ used in other places. Whenever Naomi, or Ruth uh, came back with Naomi to the land of Israel, Boaz spoke, and he said there, The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. The psalmist uses similar language in Psalm 17. He speaks there and he says, Keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. And that's the thought that the Savior is bringing out here. For the hen, whenever the chick was threatened, the wings went out and she gathered them in. And Christ is saying, This is what I did for the nation of Israel. When danger came to them, I, I sought to help them. I sought to assist. I sought to protect and, and to cover them. And we're reminded for the child of God as we read these words how great his protection is for you and I, his people. We are those, as the psalmist described, as the apple of his eye, and his protection is over us. His wings are round about us to protect us from the opposition, from the trials and tribulations of the day. Yes, we go through them. But God gives grace and strength, and his wings are there to help. In this comparison here, the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking to the nation of Israel, and he uses this picture. And as you think of the hen and the little chicks, one of the greatest threats to the hen was, was the hawk coming in, the hawk or the, the great eagle coming in. I remember in our home in the past, we used to have turkeys, and you would get them in as little chicks and rear them up for a period of time, and one day a hawk got into the shed where they were there and was just going to pick them all off one by one. And that's the picture here. These chicks were in danger, and it's a picture of the nation of Israel. The old devil desired to have them. 
In fact, there is a greater picture here. We think of the Roman army coming in at this time as well, and that onslaught that is going to happen upon the city of Israel, or the city of Jerusalem that Christ is speaking of here. The Lord Jesus Christ here is reminding us of his care. He's reminding us of the warning. He's sounding a warning out here for this people, a warning of what lay before them in future days. So as we look at the scripture, it brings a warning to the heart of the sinner. A warning that while you have life, while you have breath, while you have opportunity, there is coming a time when all of that will cease. There is coming a time when you will give an account before God for your life. Those words that are found in Ezekiel 18, that says, The soul that sinneth it shall die. It's a very solemn warning. There's sin. The soul that sinneth it shall die unless there is repentance. Unless there is that seeking after God, unless there is that crying unto him for grace and for mercy. As Christ told Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The protection here that is spoken of is that on the wings. You and I, as you look at the wings of the hen, it, it seems a feeble creature. The wings seem very fragile and light. What could they do? And yet they provide protection for the chick. They provide a place where she conceals her offspring from the enemy that is round about. There is a wonderful illustration that has been mentioned. You've maybe heard it in the past. It tells the story of a farmer. And he saw the mother, the mother hen had gathered the chicks in under her wing. There was a, a prairie fire was coming. And when the farmer went out after the fire, he found the remains of the hen. There as he gathered her up in under her wings, were, the little chicks were still alive. The wings were feeble. They were singed, they were burned, but they preserved the life of the little chicks that were underneath. And what a reminder of the great protection that Christ provides for sinful man. You need not perish. There is a way of deliverance. There is a way of hope. There is a way of salvation. There is one who can protect from the fires of an eternal hell, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Cost him his life to gather us in under the wings of his salvation, but he willingly paid it. Christ can give the greatest protection we need in this world today. He delivers the souls of men and women from eternal destruction. He brings them into that place of safety. He brings them into the kingdom of God, and he does so through that atoning work that he accomplished on the cross of Calvary. As we look here, we, we see compassion, we see comparison, but we also see condemnation. The Lord Jesus Christ, as he looked upon the city of Jerusalem, as he considered the actions of that city, that nation in the past, he says there of that one that killed the prophets and stoned them which are sent unto thee. There's a word of rebuke there. He's speaking of all of the times. He's speaking of all of the opportunities. And he said, yet when I sent the prophets to you, you, you killed them, you destroyed them. He sent the message to them to, to repent, to turn from their wickedness. They had a great privilege. They had great opportunity. And yet they revolted against the God of heaven. They wouldn't hearken. They wouldn't listen. They wouldn't heed. And in a sense, as the Lord Jesus Christ utters these words, he's really indicting them for their evil. Their evil against God's messengers. He said, you had a warning. You had opportunity. It was often, it was timely, it was repeated. And yet you rejected it. We're reminded here as he addresses the nation of Israel of the great privilege that they had. Spiritual privilege. And while there was great spiritual privilege, it, it doesn't guarantee that there will be spiritual conduct in them as we note as you look at the nation of Israel. But you know what brings with it? Responsibility. Those who know the gospel, those who know their need of a Savior, those who know the simplicity of the way of salvation in Christ, reject God, there will be that greater punishment. They refuse to obey, there will be that greater chastening. The Lord Jesus Christ in Mark 6 and the verse 11, he says at the end of that verse, he's speaking of those to whom the disciples went, he says, Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. 
What's he saying? He says there's a greater punishment for those that, that no one have heard and reject the Lord Jesus Christ than for those that never heard. What solemn words Christ uses here. Speaking of those who had the greatest of privileges, the best of privileges, knew God's intervening in their affairs. He, he protected them. He sheltered them from the hand of the enemy. And yet he says of them here, ye would not. How often I would have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. What condemning words. Didn't matter the warning was given. Didn't matter the chastisement they suffered, whether it was famine, whether it was pestilence, whether it was captivity. They were ungrateful towards God's mercy and God's grace. And as we read in these Gospels, in a short space of time, they would crucify the very Son of God and put Him to death. This little phrase that is used here, then he gets stubborn refusal. Bridle makes the comment, he says, the Greek word in both these phrases is stronger than it appears in our English translation. It was literally, I willed and he willed not. He's indicating the determination of the people here to oppose the God of heaven. We know as we read the Scriptures that Christ is more willing to save than, than people are to be saved. In fact, the Scripture reminds us there in 2 Peter 3 and 9 that Christ is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's the message of the gospel, friend. Doesn't matter how deep died a sinner you are. Doesn't matter how long you've been in your sin. The grace of God is able and sufficient to save you and to draw, him on, draw you unto himself. But sadly, it seems that many are un, uninterested. Here the Lord Jesus Christ, coming to Jerusalem, speaks of the city. Utters those terrible words, he would not. They would reject the Lord Jesus Christ. Destruction would come upon their cities. Verse 35 says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. He's indicating there that those that rejected Christ, there would be destruction. We can think of the city of Jerusalem, and we know from the history books that in a short time, Titus would come in with the Roman army, and this city would be destroyed. Oh, he's speaking here regarding the temple as well. It would be destroyed. Destroyed by the forces of Rome, and the Lord Jesus Christ is giving them that warning. A warning that destruction was coming. He also reminds them here that he was departing. As we've indicated, the crucifixion was coming. That witness that they had with the person of the Lord Jesus Christ walking amongst them, ministering, teaching, instructing, that was going to come to an end. After the crucifixion, the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to his followers. He appeared to the disciples. He appeared to those on the Emmaus Road. But he never more walked amongst the people. They were left to listen to those that were his disciples, their message of the gospel. There was going to be separation. Rejection of Christ brings separation. And when Christ leaves, is it where trouble comes? Yes, Christ's return is coming in a future day, but for those at that time, they were going to miss that opportunity. Christ was warning them here. Destruction is coming. Separation is coming. Division is coming. Now is the time to repent. Now is the time for the nation of Israel, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to come and to get right with God. Here we see his tenderness, his love, his mercy, his goodness toward them. And yet, sadly, we see it wasn't reciprocated. We see here as he spoke of Jerusalem, with tenderness and with compassion, those same people at the time of the crucifixion, there as they listened to the words of Pilate, they would say, we don't want this man to rule over us. Crucify him. Away with him. They wanted nothing to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. And friend, the question comes to each heart in our meeting this evening, do you know Christ as Savior? You have heard the gospel message. You have heard that way of salvation that is to be found by faith in Christ alone. 
And yet in your heart, you don't want God. You want to go your own way. You want to do your own thing. You, you want to live your own life. You want to enjoy the pleasures of this world. Well, if you live and if you die in that estate, then it brings separation. Separation from a holy God for all of eternity. For those that are not living for the Lord as they ought, cold of heart, backslidden, there needs to be that repentance as well. For the sinner speaks of that judgment in hell. If you reject Christ, cry this evening is, as we think upon these words, it speaks of love, grace, patience, long-suffering, compassion. That's what our Savior is. But we are reminded our God is also a holy God, a just God. He must judge sin. There will come that day when those words that we've read already, there in the verse 25, they will come to the door. They will say, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say, I know you not whence you are. Dear friend, where do you stand with God tonight? Are you saved? Are you underneath those wings of safety, those wings of protection that are found in Christ? Or are you rebelling against them? We urge you to turn from your sin. We urge you to repent of your sin. We urge you to look to Christ alone and place your trust for time and for eternity in him. Child of God, we look at these little verses and how they encourage our heart. We see the love and compassion that Christ had here for the nation of Israel. And yet what compassion, what love he has for those who are his own children. Those who are saved and washed in the blood of the Lamb. We take comfort, we take encouragement from these words. That you and I are loved and guarded as the very apple of his eye. But we are cared for and protected. That ought to thrill our hearts and souls. We live in a world today that's uncertain. We live in a world today that is changing ever so quickly. And yet for the child of God, we're not depending upon the arm of flesh. We're depending upon our God. We're rejoicing in our Savior. We are underneath the rose wings of that one who guards and protects us, even as he does the very apple of his eye. As we think upon these words, they bring warning. They bring tenderness and compassion. And our prayer and desire is this evening that for any that know not Christ, that you would know that tender love, you would experience that compassion, that you would know that saving grace that is to be found in Christ alone. We trust and pray that the Lord would bless these words to each of our hearts and challenge each one afresh this evening. Let's just close our meeting in prayer, please. Our loving God and gracious Heavenly Father, we come to Thee this evening and we rejoice in Thy mercy, in Thy grace and in Thy goodness. Lord, in providing that way of salvation as revealed in the Word of God. Our Father in Heaven, we ask and pray tonight that for any listening into this meeting, Lord, that know Thee not as Saviour, we ask and pray that in grace and mercy that Thou would touch their hearts and lovingly and tenderly draw them unto Thyself. We thank You, Lord, that we come to one who loves with an everlasting love. We come to that one of whom we can speak in that little text of Scripture, that he so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Our God in heaven, we pray tonight that thou would speak to men and women and draw them unto thyself. Our Father God, we thank you, Lord, for those that know thee and love thee. We thank you, Lord, for that assurance, that peace that we can have in the troubles and trials of life, because we can speak of that one, who is our refuge and strength, our very present help and trouble. Our Father, tonight as we leave this place, we do ask and pray that thou would be with thy people, or that they might know that pride and blessing of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, resting, remaining, and abiding upon them. For it's in Jesus' blessed name we ask all of these things. Amen.